Chapter Fifteen of Middlemarch by George Eliot. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Margaret Espayat. Black eyes you have left, you say. Blue eyes fail to draw you. Yet you seem more rapt today than of old we saw you. Oh, I track the fairest fair through new haunts of pleasure. Footprints here and echoes there guide me to my treasure. Lo, she turns, immortal youth, wrought to mortal stature, fresh as starlight's aged truth, many named nature. A great historian, as he insisted on calling himself, who had the happiness to be dead a hundred and twenty years ago, and so to take his place among the colossi whose huge leg our living pettiness is observed to walk under, glories in his copious remarks and digressions as the least imitable part of his work, and especially in those initial chapters to the successive books of his history, where he seems to bring his armchair to the proscenium and chat with us in all the lusty ease of his fine English. But Fielding lived when the days were longer, for time, like money, is measured by our needs, when summer afternoons were spacious and the clock ticked slowly in the winter evenings. We belated historians must not linger after his example, and if we did so, it is probable that our chat would be thin and eager, as if delivered from a camp-stool in a parrot-house. I, at least, have so much to do in unraveling certain human lots, and seeing how they were woven and interwoven, that all the light I can command must be concentrated on this particular web, and not dispersed over that tempting range of relevancies called the universe. At present I have to make the new settler Lydgate better known to anyone interested in him than he could possibly be even to those who had seen the most of him since his arrival in Middlemarch. For surely all must admit that a man may be puffed and belauded, envied, ridiculed, counted upon as a tool, and fallen in love with, or at least selected as a future husband, and yet remain virtually unknown, known merely as a cluster of signs for his neighbor's false suppositions. There was a general impression, however, that Lydgate was not altogether a common country doctor, and in Middlemarch at that time such an impression was significant of great things being expected from him. For everybody's family doctor was remarkably clever, and was understood to have immeasurable skill in the management and training of the most skittish or vicious diseases. The evidence of his cleverness was of the higher intuitive order, lying in his lady patient's immovable conviction, and was unassailable by any objection except that their intuitions were opposed by others equally strong. Each lady who saw medical truth in wrench and the strengthening treatment regarding taller and the lowering system as medical perdition. For the heroic times of copious bleeding and blistering had not yet departed, still less the times of thoroughgoing theory, when disease in general was called by some bad name, and treated accordingly without shilly-shally, as if, for example, it were to be called insurrection, which must not be fired on with blank cartridge, but have its blood drawn at once. The strengtheners and the lowerers were all clever men in somebody's opinion, which is really as much as can be said for any living talents. Nobody's imagination had gone so far as to conjecture that Mr. Lydgate could know as much as Dr. Sprague and Dr. Minchin, the two physicians, who alone could offer any hope when danger was extreme, and when the smallest hope was worth a guinea. Still, I repeat, there was a general impression that Lydgate was something rather more uncommon than any general practitioner in Middlemarch. And this was true. He was but seven-and-twenty, an age at which many men are not quite common, at which they are hopeful of achievement, resolute in avoidance, thinking that mammon shall never put a bit in their mouths and get astride their backs, but rather that mammon, if they have anything to do with him, shall draw their chariot. He had been left an orphan when he was fresh from a public school. His father, a military man, 
had made but little provision for three children, and when the boy Tertius asked to have a medical education, it seemed easier to his guardians to grant his request by apprenticing him to a country practitioner than to make any objections on the score of family dignity. He was one of the rarer lads who early get a decided bent and make up their minds that there is something particular in life which they would like to do for its own sake, and not because their fathers did it. Most of us who turn to any subject we love remember some morning or evening hour when we got on a high stool to reach down an untried volume, or sat with parted lips listening to a new talker, or, for very lack of books, began to listen to the voices within, as the first traceable beginning of our love. Something of that sort happened to Lydgate. He was a quick fellow, when hot from play, would toss himself in a corner, and, in five minutes, be deep in any sort of book that he could lay his hands on. If it were Rasselas or Gulliver, so much the better, but Bailey's Dictionary would do, or the Bible with the Apocrypha in it. Something he must read, when he was not riding the pony, or running and hunting, or listening to the talk of men. All this was true of him at ten years of age. He had then read through Chrysal, or The Adventures of a Guinea, which was neither milk for babes, nor any chalky mixture meant to pass for milk, and it had already occurred to him that books were stuff, and that life was stupid. His school studies had not much modified that opinion, for though he did his classics and mathematics, he was not preeminent in them. It was said of him that Lydgate could do anything he liked, but he had certainly not yet liked to do anything remarkable. He was a vigorous animal with a ready understanding, but no spark had yet kindled in him an intellectual passion. Knowledge seemed to him a very superficial affair, easily mastered. Judging from the conversation of his elders, he had apparently got already more than was necessary for mature life. Probably this was not an exceptional result of expensive teaching at that period, of short-waisted coats, and other fashions which have not yet recurred. But— one vacation, a wet day sent him to the small home library to hunt once more for a book which might have some freshness for him. In vain. Unless, indeed, he took down a dusty row of volumes with gray paper backs and dingy labels, the volumes of an old cyclopedia which he had never disturbed. It would at least be a novelty to disturb them. They were on the highest shelf, and he stood on a chair to get them down but he opened the volume which he first took from the shelf. Somehow, one is apt to read in a makeshift attitude, just where it might seem inconvenient to do so. The page he opened on was under the heading of Anatomy, and the first passage that drew his eyes was on the valves of the heart. He was not much acquainted with valves of any sort, but he knew that valve were folding doors, and through this crevice came a sudden light startling him with his first vivid notion of finely adjusted mechanism in the human frame. A liberal education had of course left him free to read the indecent passages in the school classics, but beyond a general sense of secrecy and obscenity in connection with this internal structure, had left his imagination quite unbiased, so that for anything he knew his brains lay in small bags at his temples, and he had no more thought of representing to himself how his blood circulated than how paper served instead of gold. But the moment of vocation had come, and before he got down from his chair the world was made new to him by a presentiment of endless processes filling the vast spaces planked out of his sight by that wordy ignorance which he had supposed to be knowledge. From that hour Lydgate felt the growth of an intellectual passion. We are not afraid of telling over and over again how a man comes to fall in love with a woman and be wedded to her, or else be fatally parted from her. Is it due to excess of poetry or of stupidity that we are never weary of describing what King James called a woman's makedom and her fairness? never weary of listening to the twanging of the old troubadour strings, 
and are comparatively uninterested in that other kind of makedom and fairness which must be wooed with industrious thought and patient renunciation of small desires in the story of this passion too the development varies sometimes it is the glorious marriage sometimes frustration and final parting and not seldom the catastrophe is bound up with the other passion sung by the troubadours for in the multitude of middle-aged men who go about their vocations in a daily course determined for them much in the same way as the tie of their cravats there is always a good number who once meant to shape their own deeds and alter the world a little the story of their coming to be shapen after the average and fit to be packed by the gross is hardly ever told even in their consciousness for perhaps their ardor in generous unpaid toil cooled as imperceptibly as the ardor of other youthful loves till one day their earlier self walked like a ghost in its old home and made the new furniture ghastly nothing in the world more subtle than the process of their gradual change in the beginning they inhaled it unknowingly you and i may have sent some of our breath towards infecting them when we uttered our conforming falsities or drew our silly conclusions or perhaps it came with the vibrations from a woman's glance lydgate did not mean to be one of those failures and there was the better hope of him because his scientific interest soon took the form of a professional enthusiasm he had a youthful belief in his bread-winning work not to be stifled by that initiation in makeshift called his prentice days and he carried to his studies in london edinburgh and paris the conviction that the medical profession as it might be was the finest in the world presenting the most perfect interchange between science and art offering the most direct alliance between intellectual conquest and the social good lydgate's nature demanded this combination he was an emotional creature with a flesh and blood sense of fellowship which withstood all the abstractions of special study he cared not only for cases but for john and elizabeth especially elizabeth there was another attraction in this profession it wanted reform and gave a man an opportunity for some indignant resolve to reject its venal decorations and other humbug and to be the possessor of genuine though undemanded qualifications he went to study in paris with a determination that when he came home again he would settle in some provincial town as a general practitioner and resist the irrational severance between medical and surgical knowledge in the interest of his own scientific pursuits as well as of the general advance he would keep away from the range of london intrigues jealousies and social truckling and win celebrity however slowly as jenner had done by the independent value of his work for it must be remembered that this was a dark period and in spite of venerable colleges which used great efforts to secure purity of knowledge by making it scarce and to exclude error by a rigid exclusiveness in relation to fees and appointments it happened that very ignorant young gentlemen were promoted in town and many more got a legal right to practice over large areas in the country also the high standard held up to the public mind by the college of physicians which gave its peculiar sanction to the expensive and highly rarefied medical instruction obtained by graduates of oxford and cambridge did not hinder quackery from having an excellent time of it for since professional practice chiefly consisted in giving a great many drugs the public inferred that it might be better off with more drugs still if they could only be got cheaply and hence swallowed large cubic measures of physic prescribed by unscrupulous ignorance which had taken no degrees considering that statistics had not yet embraced a calculation as to the number of ignorant or canting doctors which absolutely must exist in the teeth of all changes it seemed to lydgate that a change in the units was the most direct mode of changing the numbers he meant to be a unit who would make a certain amount of difference towards that spreading change 
which would one day tell appreciably upon the averages, and in the meantime have the pleasure of making an advantageous difference to the viscera of his own patients. But he did not simply aim at a more genuine kind of practice than was common. He was ambitious of a wider effect. He was fired with the possibility that he might work out the proof of an anatomical conception and make a link in the chain of discovery. Does it seem incongruous to you that a Middlemarch surgeon should dream of himself as a discoverer? Most of us, indeed, know little of the great originators until they have been lifted up among the constellations and already rule our fates. But that Herschel, for example, who broke the barriers of the heavens, did he not once play a provincial church organ and give music lessons to stumbling pianists? Each of those shining ones had to walk on the earth among neighbors who perhaps thought more of his gait and his garments than of anything which was to give him a title to everlasting fame. Each of them had his little local personal history, sprinkled with small temptations and sordid cares, which made the retarding friction of his course towards final companionship with the immortals. Lydgate was not blind to the dangers of such friction, but he had plenty of confidence in his resolution to avoid it as far as possible. Being seven and twenty, he felt himself experienced, and he was not going to have his vanities provoked by contact with the showy worldly successes of the capital, but to live among people who could hold no rivalry with that pursuit of a great idea which was to be a twin object with the assiduous practice of his profession. There was fascination in the hope that the two purposes would illuminate each other, the careful observation and inference which was his daily work, the use of the lens to further his judgment in special cases, would further his thought as an instrument of larger inquiry. Was not this the typical preeminence of his profession? He would be a good Middlemarch doctor, and by that very means keep himself in the track of far-reaching investigation. On one point he may fairly claim approval at this particular stage of his career. He did not mean to imitate those philanthropic models who make a profit out of poisonous pickles to support themselves while they are exposing adulteration, or hold shares in a gambling hell that they may have leisure to represent the cause of public morality. He intended to begin in his own case some particular reforms which were quite certainly within his reach, and much less of a problem than the demonstrating of an anatomical conception. One of these reforms was to act stoutly on the strength of a recent legal decision, and simply prescribe, without dispensing drugs or taking percentage from druggists. This was an innovation for one who had chosen to adopt the style of general practitioner in a country town, and would be felt as offensive criticism by his professional brethren. But Lydgate meant to innovate in his treatment also, and he was wise enough to see that the best security for his practicing honestly, according to his belief, was to get rid of systematic temptations to the contrary. Perhaps that was a more cheerful time for observers and theorizers than the present. We are apt to think at the finest era of the world when America was beginning to be discovered, when a bold sailor, even if he were wrecked, might alight on a new kingdom, and about 1829 the dark territories of pathology were a fine America for a spirited young adventurer. Lydgate was ambitious above all to contribute towards enlarging the scientific, rational basis of his profession. The more he became interested in special questions of disease, such as the nature of fever or fevers, the more keenly he felt the need for that fundamental knowledge of structure which just at the beginning of the century had been illuminated by the brief and glorious career of Bichat, who died when he was only one and thirty, but, like another Alexander, left a realm large enough for many heirs. That great Frenchman first carried out the conception that living bodies, fundamentally considered, are not associations of organs which can be understood by studying them first apart, 
and then as if it were federally, but must be regarded as consisting of certain primary webs or tissues, out of which the various organs, brain, heart, lungs, and so on, are compacted, as the various accommodations of a house are built up in various proportions of wood, iron, stone, brick, zinc, and the rest, each material having its peculiar composition and proportions. No man, one sees, can understand and estimate the entire structure or its parts, what are its frailties and what its repairs, without knowing the nature of the materials. And the conception wrought out by Bichat, with his detailed study of the different tissues, acted necessarily on medical questions as the turning of gaslight would act on a dim, oil-lit street, showing new connections and hitherto hidden facts of structure which must be taken into account in considering the symptoms of maladies and the action of medicaments. But results which depend on human conscience and intelligence work slowly, and now, at the end of 1829, most medical practice was still strutting or shambling along the old paths, and there was still scientific work to be done which might have seemed to be a direct sequence of Bichat's. This great seer did not go beyond the consideration of the tissues as ultimate facts in the living organism, marking the limit of anatomical analysis, but it was open to another mind to say, have not these structures some common basis from which they have all started, as your sarsnet, gauze, net, satin, and velvet from the raw cocoon? Here would be another light, as of oxyhydrogen, showing the very grain of things, and revising all former explanations. Of this sequence to Bichat's work, already vibrating along many currents of the European mind, Lydgate was enamoured. He longed to demonstrate the more intimate relations of living structure, and help to define men's thoughts more accurately after the true order. The work had not yet been done, but only prepared for those who know how to use the preparation. What was the primitive tissue? In that way Lydgate put the question, not quite in the way required by the awaiting answer, but such missing of the right word befalls many seekers. And he counted on quiet intervals to be watchfully seized for taking up the threads of investigation, on many hints to be won from diligent application, not only of the scalpel, but of the microscope, which research had begun to use again with new enthusiasm of reliance. Such was Lydgate's plan of his future, to do good small work for Middlemarch, and great work for the world. He was certainly a happy fellow at this time, to be seven-and-twenty, without any fixed vices, with a generous resolution that his action should, that his action should be beneficent, and with ideas in his brain that made life interesting quite apart from the cultus of horseflesh and other mystic rites of costly observance, which the eight hundred pounds left him after buying his practice would certainly not have gone far in paying for. He was at a starting point which makes many a man's career a fine subject for betting, if there were any gentlemen given to that amusement who could appreciate the complicated probabilities of an arduous purpose, with all the possible thwartings and furtherings of circumstance, all the niceties of inward balance by which a man swims and makes his point, or else is carried headlong. The risk would remain, even with close knowledge of Lydgate's character, for character, too, is a process and an unfolding. The man was still in the making, as much as the Middlemarch doctor and immortal discoverer, and there were both virtues and faults capable of shrinking or expanding. The faults will not, I hope, be a reason for the withdrawal of your interest in him. Among our valued friends, is there not some one or other who is a little too self-confident and disdainful, whose distinguished mind is a little spotted with commonness, who is a little pinched here and protuberant there with native prejudices, or whose better energies are liable to lapse down the wrong channel under the influence of transient solicitations? All these things might be alleged against Lydgate, but then they are the paraphrases of a polite preacher who talks of Adam and would not like to mention anything painful to the pew-renters. 
the particular faults from which these delicate generalities are distilled have distinguishable physiognomies diction and grimaces filling up parts in very various dramas our vanities differ as our noses do all conceit is not the same conceit but varies in correspondence with the minutiae of mental make in which one of us differs from another lydgate's conceit was of the arrogant sort never simpering never impertinent but massive in its claims and benevolently contemptuous he would do a great deal for noodles being sorry for them and feeling quite sure that they could have no power over him he had thought of joining the saint simonians when he was in paris in order to turn them against some of their own doctrines all his faults were marked by kindred traits and were those of a man who had a fine baritone whose clothes hung well upon him and who even in his ordinary gestures had an air of inbred distinction where then lay the spots of commonness says a young lady enamoured of that careless grace how could there be any commonness in a man so well bred so ambitious of social distinction so generous and unusual in his views of social duty as easily as there may be stupidity in a man of genius if you take him unawares on the wrong subject or as many a man who has the best will to advance the social millennium might be ill-inspired in imagining its lighter pleasures unable to go beyond offenbach's music or the brilliant punning in the last burlesque lydgate's spot of commonness lay in the complexion of his prejudices which in spite of noble intentions and sympathy were half of them such as are found in ordinary men of the world that distinction of mind which belonged to his intellectual ardor did not penetrate his feeling and judgment about furniture or women or the desirability of its being known without his telling that he was better born than other country surgeons he did not mean to think of furniture at present but whenever he did so it was to be feared that neither biology nor schemes of reform would lift him above the vulgarity of feeling that there would be an incompatibility in his furniture not being of the best as to women he had once already been drawn headlong by impetuous folly which he meant to be final since marriage at some distant period would of course not be impetuous for those who want to be acquainted with lydgate it will be good to know what was that case of impetuous folly for it may stand as an example of the fitful swerving of passion to which he was prone together with the chivalrous kindness which helped to make him morally lovable the story can be told without many words it happened when he was studying in paris and just at the time when over and above his other work he was occupied with some galvanic experiments one evening tired with his experimenting and not being able to elicit the facts he needed he left his frogs and rabbits to some repose under their trying and mysterious dispensation of unexplained shocks and went to finish his evening at the theatre of the port saint martin where there was a melodrama which he had already seen several times attracted not by the ingenious work of the collaborating authors but by an actress whose part it was to stab her lover mistaking him for the evil designing duke of the piece lydgate was in love with this actress as a man is in love with a woman whom he never expects to speak to she was a provencal with dark eyes a greek profile and rounded majestic form having that sort of beauty which carries a sweet matronliness even in youth and her voice was a soft cooing she had but lately come to paris and bore a virtuous reputation her husband acting with her as the unfortunate lover it was her acting which was no better than it should be but the public was satisfied lydgate's only relaxation now was to go and look at this woman just as he might have thrown himself under the breath of the sweet south on a bank of violets for a while without prejudice to his galvanism to which he would presently return but this evening the old drama had a new catastrophe at the moment when the heroine was to act the stabbing of her lover and he was to fall gracefully the wife veritably stabbed her husband who fell as death willed a wild shriek pierced the house 
and the Provencal fell swooning. A shriek and a swoon were demanded by the play, but the swooning too was real this time. Lydgate leaped and climbed, he hardly knew how, onto the stage, and was active in help, making the acquaintance of his heroine by finding a contusion on her head and lifting her gently in his arms. Paris rang with the story of this death. Was it a murder? Some of the actress's warmest admirers were inclined to believe in her guilt, and liked her the better for it. Such was the taste of those times. But Lydgate was not one of these. He vehemently contended for her innocence, and the remote impersonal passion for her beauty which he had felt before had passed now into personal devotion and tender thought of her lot. The notion of murder was absurd. No motive was discoverable, the young couple being understood to dote on each other, and it was not unprecedented that an accidental slip of the foot should have brought these grave consequences. The legal investigation ended in Madame Lor's release. Lydgate, by this time, had had many interviews with her, and found her more and more adorable. She talked little, but that was an additional charm. She was melancholy, and seemed grateful. Her presence was enough, like that of the evening light. Lydgate was madly anxious about her affection, and jealous lest any other man than himself should win it and ask her to marry him. But instead of reopening her engagement at the Porte Saint-Martin, where she would have been all the more popular for the fatal episode, she left Paris without warning, forsaking her little court of admirers. Perhaps no one carried an inquiry far except Lydgate, who felt that all science had come to a standstill while he imagined the unhappy law, stricken by ever-wandering sorrow, herself wandering, and finding no faithful comforter. Hidden actresses, however, are not so difficult to find as some other hidden facts, and it was not long before Lydgate gathered indications that Lar had taken the route to Lyon. He found her at last acting with great success at Avignon under the same name, looking more majestic than ever as a forsaken wife carrying her child in her arms. He spoke to her after the play, was received with the usual quietude which seemed to him beautiful as clear depths of water, and obtained leave to visit her on the next day, when he was bent on telling her that he adored her and on asking her to marry him. He knew that this was like the sudden impulse of a madman, incongruous even with his habitual foibles. No matter, it was the one thing which he was resolved to do. He had two selves within him, apparently, and they must learn to accommodate each other and bear reciprocal impediments. Strange that some of us, with quick alternate vision, see beyond our infatuations, and even while we rave on the heights, behold the wide plain where our persistent self pauses and awaits us. To have approached Lau with any suit that was not reverentially tender would have been simply a contradiction of his whole feeling towards her. "'You have come all the way from Paris to find me,' she said to him the next day, sitting before him with folded arms and looking at him with eyes that seemed to wonder as an untamed ruminating animal wonders. "'Are all Englishmen like that?' "'I came because I could not live without trying to see you. You are lonely. I love you. I want you to consent to be my wife. I will wait, but I want you to promise that you will marry me, no one else.' Laura looked at him in silence, with a melancholy radiance from under her grand eyelids, until he was full of rapturous certainty, and knelt close to her knees. "'I will tell you something,' she said in her cooing way, keeping her arms folded. "'My foot really slipped.' "'I know, I know,' said Lydgate, deprecatingly. "'It was a fatal accident, a dreadful stroke of calamity that bound me to you the more.' Again Laura paused a little, and then said slowly, "'I meant to do it.' Lydgate, strong man as he was, turned pale and trembled. Moments seemed to pass before he rose and stood at a distance from her. "'There was a secret, then,' he said at last, 
even vehemently. He was brutal to you. You hated him. No. He worried me. He was too fond. He would live in Paris, and not in my country. That was not agreeable to me. Great God, said Lydgate, in a groan of horror. And you planned to murder him? I did not plan. It came to me in the play. I meant to do it. Lydgate stood mute, and unconsciously pressed his hat on while he looked at her. He saw this woman, the first to whom he had given his young adoration, amid the throng of stupid criminals. "'You are a good young man,' she said. "'But I do not like husbands. I will never have another.' Three days afterwards Lydgate was at his galvanism again in his Paris chambers, believing that illusions were at an end for him. He was saved from hardening effects by the abundant kindness of his heart and his belief that human life might be made better. But he had more reason than ever for trusting his judgment, now that it was so experienced, and henceforth he would take a strictly scientific view of woman, entertaining no expectations, but such as were justified beforehand. No one in Middlemarch was likely to have such a notion of Lydgate's past as here has been faintly shadowed, and, indeed, the respectable townsfolk there were not more given than mortals generally to any eager attempt at exactness in the representation to themselves of what did not come under their own senses. Not only young virgins of the town, but grey-bearded men also, were often in haste to conjecture how a new acquaintance might be wrought into their purposes, contented with very vague knowledge as to the way in which life had been shaping him for that instrumentality. Middlemarch, in fact, counted on swallowing Lydgate and assimilating him very comfortably. End of chapter 15